want to welcome everyone uh, here today. My name is John Burke. I'm the superintendent at the Lewis and Clark National Park. And amongst the many things that I'm super proud of is that um, uh, working with the community partners, we figured out how to combine beer and science. And that's a pretty cool thing. Um, the science, I, we combine science with beer. We put the science first. But um, I really want to uh, thank you all for coming out to Nature Matters. It, I love the way we describe it, that it's a conversation where nature and culture intersect. And the response is with beer. Or wine. Or wine. Whatever it gets you through the Or water. Um, <laughs> water is, but, uh, this speaker series is kind of neat because it's, it's hosted by a lot of folks. Uh, of course, you know, we're super proud at, at the National Park Service, the Clark National Historical Park, uh, to, to be a part of it in partnership with the North Coast Water Sedge Association, our awesome, in fact, visit their table, um, our awesome park partner, the Lewis and Clark National Park Association, and of course, Fort George Brewery. So everyone thank Fort George Brewery for hosting. We're doing this, you know, every, every fourth Thursday, except for we had to reschedule this one. From, uh, but every fourth Thursday of the uh, month from October to May, so um, we've got one more, or, or do we end at this, but check out Fort George's website for beer and science. Um, so our speakers today are uh, uh, Jesse Jones and uh, Alexandra Burgos. Uh, Jesse's the program manager for Coast Watch, a program of the Oregon Shores uh, Conservation Coalition. And, and Jesse also shared with me that she was kind of in on the ground floor of this thing when they were trying to decide, should we do a lecture series? How many years ago was it? 11, 11, 11. That is awesome. Yeah, 11 years ago. She's upstairs over beer. How cool is that? Um, uh, she and one of our great people, uh, Carla uh, Cole, or uh, and, uh, She's really extremely familiar with this, as I said, because you know, she once hosted this speaker series. Uh, at its inception, and, and in her current role, uh, she partners with the park and other organizations in, uh, to implement various Oregon Shores program. Uh, Alessandra is a meteorologist and oceanographer, which is awesome and cool. Um, uh, she currently is serving as the program manager for the Cascadia Copez Hub, which is uh, helping coastal communities like ours uh, prepare and adapt for coastal uh, hazards. I uh, really want to thank you both for uh, coming out and uh, sharing your time with us to present this. So, everyone, welcome Jesse and Alessandra. talk that I've done that wasn't Zoom in a very long time, so you'll have to bear with me if I get uh, comfortable here. Um, so I want to thank Fort George, thank you uh, Fort Classic, um, and the North Coast Watch Association for having us here tonight. Um, this presentation was originally scheduled for December. There was a little bit of a snowstorm, and so it was postponed, and so we are here tonight um, instead. Um, it's all this thing. Um, every winter, I organize a number of King Tides talks. Um, and for those talks, all of the down the Oregon coast, I ask a number of different experts to join me to talk about something related to resiliency. Um, or the science of tides, but a lot of times it's related to how do we protect ourselves on the Oregon coast and how do we plan for the future. Um, so in the past, um, I've had folks like Peter Ruggiero um, and Sally Hacker, um, and then I think two years ago, they actually spoke about getting the grant that funded Abby's program. And so I'm excited to um, introduce her in a little bit, but I'm going to talk first a little bit about what the Oregon King Tides Project is. 
So there's a little bit of a relation here we're talking about resiliency um, on the Oregon Coast. So once again, my name is Jesse Jones, and I work for um, an organization called Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition. And Oregon Shores is dedicated to preserving access to the coast. And they have been working for 51 years, 52 years now, um, with coastal residents from here all the way down to the California border on keeping our uh, coast accessible and keeping an eye on development that happens with the coast. So they are the umbrella organization of Coast Watch. And Coast Watch is a mile-by-mile -mile beach adoption program. We are now in our 30th year. Um, and we work to educate volunteers and the general public. You can adopt a mile, you walk your mile four times a year, you make observations, and you put those onto our website. So it's just a simple observational, non-scientific program. But um, if you want to get deeper uh, and get to know your mile a bit more, you can actually join a citizen science or community science project with us. So I do a lot of introductions to our more trepid volunteers who would like to collect science and data for scientists from the Oregon Coast. Um, so community science, citizen science, we have numerous programs, one of which is the Oregon King Tides Project. We do uh, CSAR surveys, uh, marine debris surveys, uh, dead bird surveys, so I connect volunteers with other organizations, scientists and universities, to do this data, and we all work together to train our volunteers. These are a number of our partners. We work with the Oregon Marine Reserve Program, NOAA, the Oregon Coast Management Program is our partner for the Oregon King Tides Project, the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, Oregon Coast Aquarium, Oregon Pisco, and many others. So, what is the Oregon King Tides Project? The Oregon King Tides Project is a citizen science and community science project that gets volunteers together to take photos of the influx and how far the waters come in during the highest tides of the year in all of our coastal communities. So it's a photo project, and originally it was called the Oregon King Tides Photo Project, um, but now it's just called the Oregon King Tides Project. And this has been happening for, four, this will be our 14th year, this winter, this coming winter. Um, it's also happening in California and in Washington. And the King name really came from Australia, so they were the first ones to really call it the King Tides Project. But King Tides are actually spring tides. They're also called Perigean Tides. Um, and they're really just the highest tides of the year. This is a graph that I found um, about sea level rise in Astoria specifically. So I am not trained to really talk about or decipher this graph, but one of the reasons why the King Tide Project exists is so that we can really think about sea level rise and start to measure sea level rise. Um, we are observing sea level rise, we are learning about sea level rise through photographs that really look at how close the waters are coming into our communities. So the object is for volunteers to really observe the tides, document these tides, and um, they're all kept on the Oregon King Tides website. Um, so OregonKingTides.net, and after I'm done, after um, Ali is done tonight, I can answer questions and I will also be at my table. Um, to answer questions also, but it's OregonKingTides.net. You can get onto this website and you can see photos from the last four, 13 years um, across the state, well, along the, along the Oregon coast. And really we're looking at um, not just the like, coastal beach inundation, but we're also looking for tidal rivers and estuaries as well. You can see in the lower right-hand corner, that's right, right around here, actually. That's uh, either Highway 202 or Lewis and Clark Road. 
and we have um, the Gahats in the city area, and then this top one is, is banded. And so volunteers from all up and down the coast are taking these photos and putting them into a database. So it's another way of engaging people in the science and really um, working with them to understand how their communities are affected by the tides. So the project is not just like a data collection, but it's also um, teaching people, engaging them, getting them to be interested where they live and how their communities may be affected in the future. So this is a slide that's showing you how the photos actually are mapping sea level rise. And so the folks at Oregon Coast Management Program, who also oversee the website, um, they are working and looking at the images every year and actually working then with community leaders to plan for the future. So one way to think about this is that the king tides today, or the spring tides today, are the high tides of tomorrow. Now the waters aren't rising as fast on the west coast as they are on the east coast, but they are rising. And if you have a storm before you have a high tide event, and you're getting all of these different factors and you're getting a very, very large tide. So our average tides are about six feet every day. In the winter time, they can go up to 12 feet if we have a storm surge. So some of you have probably noticed, if you don't know, like if you don't know that you're driving around on a high tide day, wow, it's really flooded today. There's a lot going on. It's probably a high tide event or a king tide event. So we talked a little bit about this. Um, some people ask, well, why are they called king tides? Why aren't they called queen tides? <laughs> So I've been talking with um, my colleagues at the Oregon Coast Management Program about maybe using the word spring more often, which is really the tides are springing forth. So it's a neat way of um, kind of illustrating that. And so when do the king tides happen? Well, they happen when the sun and the moon and the earth are all lined up. So when I was growing up, I learned that the moon affected the tides, but the sun also plays a big role in that as well. Without it, we wouldn't have king tides. I also have on the right side is um, an image of what a neak tide is, and that neak tide is just that area between the two tides. So it's a, tide, it's a time when things are just a little bit mellower. There are a lot of great uh, short videos about the tides, about king tides um, on YouTube, and I highly recommend watching them if you want to really kind of geek out about the tides. So next season, um, I'm not quite sure when exactly the tides are happening, but the project usually takes place in November, December, and January. Um, sometimes we get a bonus king tide in February. So these were the ones last year, so I just put these up here. Um, and so they'll be happening around the same time uh, this next season. And as soon as we know those, we will announce them. So I'm going to show you a few photos. So the photos, um, they're very easy to upload onto the Oregon King Tides website when the time is right. Um, and you want to take photos of uh, you know, water affecting infrastructure, um, buildings, uh, pathways. So I'm going to show you a few different examples. This is a pipe in Florence that is covered with water. Some of these photos are recent, some of these have been were taken a long time ago. We have volunteers from the air, so that's really cool. They show um, the peak of the high tide. There are a lot of those photos on the Oregon King Tide website. So this is, a, this is definitely a photo of Highway 202, because I took this one. This happens every single year, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. What's also interesting is sometimes people will submit photos um, of an event that happened. Like, so this driftwood was lower on the beach and then was actually deposited on the beach after it came tight. 
So those are helpful too. Here we have um, a building in Bandon, Oregon. Something else is, uh, that's helpful for these is to show comparison photos. Um, so this is a very beautiful example of a comparison photo. Um, comparison photos can show what a regular high tide looks like and then what a king tide looks like. So we don't want photos that are showing a low tide and a king tide, a regular high tide and then a, um, just an average high tide. Every year we have a contest. This one won one year um, with the Oregon Coast Visitors Association to kind of uh, get people, inspire them to, um, to take photos and submit them. Here's another a uh, very high tide, this is the Yahats River. So very quickly, um, this is an image of the Oregon King Tides website. So you can get in here and um, you can look at different maps, albums, and the current season, which right now is actually last season. <laughs> and so when you get onto one of the maps, you can see you can these little dots here, you can click a dot, and then it will show you, um, and this isn't, this isn't showing everything, um, unfortunately, but this is Seaside. This is just this last winter in December um, on, the, on the Mechanica River. So it's a wonderful project. You can see a lot on this website. You can get really involved. You can look at photos. You can talk to people and tell them, hey, have you checked out your neighborhood? Have you checked out your community yet? Um, so I would love for some of you, if not all of you, to get involved uh, this, this winter if you would like to um, take pictures and be a part of the Oregon King Tides project. Um, and you can ask me more questions after we are done. But now I'm going to introduce um, Ali. So um, Ali Burgos, this is my first time meeting her in person tonight. We were supposed to meet in December. And I had asked Ali um, to come and talk about uh, her project, which she's going to tell you more about. And you learned a little bit about her already, but in case some of you were here, I'm going to introduce her again. Um, Ali is a meteorologist and oceanographer. Um, she lived through Hurricane Sandy, which deepened her curiosity of the natural world. She then moved to Norfolk, Virginia, to work on sea level rise and flooding issues after a stint in Washington, D.C., working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, she moved to Portland and now currently works for Oregon State University. Ali is the program manager for the Cascadia Coast Hub, which is helping Pacific Northwest coastal communities prepare and adapt to coastal hazards through research and community engagement. And so the title of her talk is How to Cascadia Coastal Communities Increase Their Resilience to Coastal Hazards. Welcome, Ali. Thank you so much, Jesse, for telling us about your project. Um, so, first I'm going to start off with a little game, one to get me less nervous and you guys hopefully more engaged. And so, the question is, <clears throat> what coastal and environmental hazards do Cascadia coastal communities face? Raise your hand, give me an answer. I'm going to... What hazards do we face? Yeah, yell it out. Flooding, yep. Good rise. Tsunami. Tsunami, yeah, hundred percent. What else? Erosion. Erosion, yeah, you got it. What else? Earthquake. Tourists. Tourists. Earthquakes. Yep. Dead whale. Say that again. Dead whale. Dead whales. Yeah, I did not think of that one, but that is definitely a environmental hazard. They show up on our shore. Pollution. Pollution? Yeah. What types of pollution do we have? Plastic. Plastic? Like yeah. Plastic. Huge one. Anyone else? French bar. <laughs> King tides. Yeah, that's part of flooding. Yeah, back right here. Subduction. Subduction. Yeah, that goes into our, our earthquake. Warm, warming waters. Warming waters? You already got one. I got one. <laughs> Invasive species. Oh, Acidification. Man, you guys are thinking of way more than I had on my list. That's great. How do we win? Yes. Ah, 
Oh, 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 yeah. oh, 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 sure. So I'm going to get that. All right, I'm going to stop there. That was great. You guys are very, very knowledgeable. <laughs> so here are all the hazards that I quickly put on, but we have a lot of extra ones, too. Um, we have air and water, water quality issues, drought issues, loss of wetland ecosystems, and then flooding and sea level rise is a major one and one that I will be talking about more. So flooding could be from storm surge, king tides, and also river flooding. And there are a lot of natural hazards that are being fueled by climate change that our communities are dealing with. Here's a picture of erosion coming very close to people's homes. This is a landslide that happened um, on Highway 101 south of Port Orford this January from heavy rains. And then, of course, we have, as sea level rise is increasing, this is going to be affecting flooding and storm surge, and then also our king tides get higher as well. So for some background, our oceans are rising on average about 3.4 millimeters per year, which we know from satellite measurements starting from 1993. Now, there are two big contributing factors to that. One is thermal expansion. So as our planet gets warmer, those water molecules get warm and they get more excited and start taking up more space. The second is ice sheet melt. So Antarctica, that glacier is losing ice mass at an average rate of 150 billion tons per year. And Greenland is losing about 270 billion tons per year. Now, one million tons of ice melt from these glaciers results in about three millimeters of sea level rise. Could you, uh, uh, millimeters versus inches, can you give us something? <laughs> 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 25 millimeters. 25 million years ago. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Now what's interesting is that ice melt and that thermal expansion does not affect the rise of the oceans equally. Each location along the coast sees different rates of sea level rise, which is what we call relative sea level rise. Now this graph shows how the sea level is rising around the world, and you can see how it differs. Now the west coast, like just mentioned, has slower rates of sea level rise compared to the Gulf or east coast of the state. So it's a little hard to tell, but red here is about 15 centimeters. Um, and the yellowish is, and yellow white is zero. Now there are, there are other factors that affect our relative sea level rise. One is vertical land movement. So our land is shifting up and down also changing ocean dynamics. So that's things like changing currents. The currents can change in their speed and location, and all that affects uh, your location's relative sea level rise. And then we have these natural events. So how many people have heard of an El Nino and a La Nina? So basically everyone. That's, um, so these climate events happen every eight to 10 years or so. And the La Nina that we were just in has been helping, for example, the Cascades get a lot of snow. But when we have an El Nino condition, this is what causes the oceans to become warmer. In the graph, the red and orange are above average ocean temperatures. And as we just heard, that causes thermal expansion, our oceans warm up, and then sea level rise gets higher. With a warming climate, we know that El Nino events will increase in frequency and strength. Now, Jesse had showed a picture of sea level rise here in Astoria, and your relative sea level rise is actually negative. That's relative to the land here. And so, the reason why is because your vertical land motion is actually lowering down. So this map shows how the coastlines are either rising or sinking. Um, the reds are vertical, velocity moving up, so land is moving up, and then blues and greens are as the land is sinking. So in, here in Astoria, the land is rising about 0.6 millimeters per year. So we're going ahead of what the sea level is actually rising in the area. But, <laughs> unfortunately, we know that's not going to continue. Sea level rise is accelerating. 
So it's not on a linear scale. It is actually speeding up. And we can expect that it's going to have more of an impact in the future. So these are the sea level rise estimates for Astoria out to 2100 for several different scenarios. So when we look at sea level rise, we look at very low base scenarios, so things that are not likely. So the lowest scenario, right above the zero point, that is very, very low probability that that is actually what it's going to look like. Out in the yellow, very, very high scenario, also probably will not occur either. So somewhere in the middle is generally where we start to look at our projections and use that for sea level rise planning. Plus, we already see sea level changes along the coast, like in South Beach of Oregon, where they're experiencing about 1.7 millimeters per year. So sea level rise is going to lead to more erosion, higher peak tides, higher storm surge, and flooding. So what can we do? Luckily, there are lots of scientists all over the world that are researching how communities can adapt and be more resilient to these hazards. And so that's what brings me here today, is to actually talk to you about the project that I'm helping to manage. So the Cascadia Coastlines and People's Hazards Research Hub, or what I'm just going to call the hub for the rest of the night, is a five-year project funded by the National Science Foundation that is bringing together researchers from all of these universities and programs. So I'm from Oregon State University. We have a lot of partners up at University of Washington, University of Oregon, Humboldt State, and then all the Sea Grants, USGS, um, that are helping to for this issue. So our main goal is to help communities in the Pacific Northwest prepare and adapt to coastal hazards by gaining a better understanding of these natural hazards and how they impact communities through research and engaging with coastal communities. So we're really trying to not also just do science for the sake of science. We really want to contribute to communities' resilience while upholding their identities and needs and values and understanding that each community is different. We're also trying to inform hazard assessments, mitigation, and adaptation measures while we're collaborating with those communities. So all our research is going to span across all of Cascadia. So that's from Northern California up through Northern Washington. It's a huge region, right? That's a lot to study and learn. So we're first starting to focus on what we're calling these collaboratories, which are basically those blue dots there. And sorry, there's supposed to be text on that side, but we picked those areas because we already have existing research going on there and partnership partners. So that kind of can give us a springboard to start a lot of our research. Now, how we do everything and try to support that big vision of you know, supporting communities and upping their resilience is broken out into teams. So we have over 100 people now working towards those goals. Also, managing 100 people is very difficult, and I'm still learning how to do it. But we have people from undergraduates, students, all the way up to senior researchers who are working on all of these little bits of these coastal hazards issues. So first, team one is looking at things like earthquakes and landslides, tsunamis. Team two, which I'll go more into, is sea level rise and flooding and erosion, helping those communities prepare, respond, and recover from hazards. Four is trying to bring in more underrepresented students into STEAM. STEAM, if you haven't heard, is STEM, but with A for arts. And finally, team five is everyone on the hub and is working towards more co-production or working with communities to engage with them and learn from them and help making sure that the work that we're doing is actually helping them. So while each team has their own separate research, we're all trying to weave them together, again, aimed at creating more resilient communities. So I'm gonna give some samples of what teams one and three are doing to give you an idea of the different types of projects that we're working on. So for team two, uh, that ha they have a couple of goals. One is to measure the risks from flooding and sea level rise. So the sea level rise photos that I was showing you earlier gives us an idea of how high the water will be in the future. But we're researching how that's actually going to be impacting communities, the coastlines, and habitats itself. Now the coastal zone will change through erosion and habitat loss or gain. We're also looking at how natural and nature-based features, so things like salt marshes, 
could support resiliencies of communities. So we know that flooding and erosion will increase, but by how much? And so the work that I'm going to show you here is being done by one of our PhD students, Meredith Leung, and to assess chronic hazards like erosion, we rely on what we call hazard proxies. So these proxies let us use very simple thresholds to determine whether hazardous conditions are being met or not. So we look at unsafe beach hours, so when the beach is too narrow to play or work, Collision hours, it's a proxy for erosion, and that's when water levels are higher than the base of a dune, but the water doesn't go over it. And then overtopping is a proxy for flooding. So that's when water levels are now higher than something like a dune and is now flooding behind it. So using a model, we created estimates for how these proxies will change in the future. So that first picture on the left there shows uh, our baseline if there is no sea level rise, and, the and that's the percent that these hazards will occur. So you can see the S, C, and O, so we have the unsafe beach, collision hours, and overtopping hours, and then the colors that represent that. So comparing to that baseline is where we get the other three plots. We can see how these hazards are changing based on 0.5 meters of sea level rise up to 1.5 meters of sea level rise. And that's our low to our high categories for that sea level change. And then we have the medium in the middle too. So under all sea level rise scenarios, overtopping, so the water going over the dunes, remains pretty rare, mostly due to large dunes in the region and a lack of tropical storms or cyclones which would allow storm surge to flood behind the dunes more easily. So that's not happening as often, and we don't see that happening with high sea level rise either. But we do see unsafe beach hours, which is again usability of the beach, and collision hours, which is our erosion. And we see those increasing 25%, 30%, and 40%, depending on your sea level rise scenario. Now, for these results, stakeholders and people that we've talked to in the communities have expressed a need to identify the areas that aren't experiencing hazards yet, but will in the future, since those areas might be underprepared for increasing coastal hazards since they haven't experienced dealing with them yet. So, what Meredith is going to start doing is identifying those potential areas in the future and finding hot spots to see where we could see significantly higher impacts of these hazards in the future. So those are the next steps for, those, for that project. Now that's just one project that that team is doing. We have a lot more going on, including understanding how changes in a river shape could affect flooding, how dynamic revetments or cobble berms can reduce wave energy and stop or slow coastal erosion, and then also monitoring the near shore and beach change. Now, all those other hazards that I mentioned, our hub is also researching a lot of them. So who has heard of the big one, or what some people call the really big one? <laughs> so I imagine just about everyone, there might be a few people in here that has not heard of it. Um, when I moved here from the East Coast and I read about this for the first time, I was like, oh my god, where did I move to? Um, <laughs> but now that I've read more about it, it seems less scary though my partner might say that I have a little anxiety about it. So for those that don't know, we have two tectonic plates that are pushed against each other. We have the Juan de Fuca plate off the coast and the North America plate. Where these plates meet is called the Cascadia subduction zone or the CSC and that's where the ocean plate is subducting or going underneath the other plate. Now these plates are moving slowly but when they give in a big way or slip, that's what causes an earthquake. Now this fault zone has the potential of creating a magnitude 9 earthquake. Now, magnitudes of an earthquake are reported on a log scale. So a magnitude 8 quake is about 30 times more powerful than a 7. And a magnitude 9 is 900 times more powerful than a 7. So who has experienced an earthquake? How long did it last? A couple, couple minutes? How old do you know how many? In California? Okay. Okay. Okay, 
so those are really big ones. What about, I saw a hand right here, how long? It was probably a second. A few seconds. How many people, uh, yeah? The early 70s, it wasn't the more creative, it was the Valley Valley Clay. Mm -hmm. I had huge recordings in my head when I was like 14 years old, on my bed, watching Just the big sloshy yeah, yeah, moving and everywhere. It was a couple of times. It was a yeah. So a lot of you have had this experience. If you haven't experienced an earthquake or an, I was expecting more people to say a few seconds, maybe a minute. But for the magnitude 9 earthquake, you could expect very, very severe shaking for about five minutes. So think about that for a second. Everything is moving for five minutes. That is a long time, and that's a big problem and one that we need to better understand. Now the Cascadia subduction zone has really only started to be studied since the 80s, so it's a relatively new problem that people are starting to learn about. We know that the last big event happened 322 years ago, and that these large ruptures happen every 300 to 500 years. This will affect Northern California all the way up to British Columbia. And there's about a 15% chance of this occurring in the next 50 years, and an 85% chance that a destructive earthquake, but a lower magnitude, so not a magnitude 9, will also happen somewhere in Cascadia in the next 50 years. Now, we're prone as people, and I definitely do this, is that when we hear that statement, in the next 50 years, you might think, okay, well, in the, in the next 50 years, right, on, on the later time scale of that. But, in truth, it could happen next month, or it could happen in 50 years, it could happen in 100 years, it could happen in another 400 years. The thing is, we just, we don't know when. But, we can be more prepared for when it does happen. And so, this is critical not only because of the destructive shaking, but what's going to come after the earthquake. Tsunami. Tsunami, yeah. So, we've seen this happen. A magnitude 9 struck off the coast of Japan in March of 2011. Now, about 94% of people living in the inundation zone lived because of their preparedness. And so this is my very quick PSA, is you feel shaking, drop in cover, and hold on until the shaking stops. Please do not go in a doorway. And if you're at the coast and you feel shaking or see the water retreat, quickly try to get to high ground. So, quick PSA there. So it's critical to immediately move to high ground on the coast because if a magnitude 9 earthquake occurs, that tsunami will arrive pretty quickly. So this is a model showing the tsunami arrival time from one of our partners at University of Oregon. So northern Oregon has about 30 to 40 minutes once shaking starts for the tsunami to arrive. In southern California, Oregon, that time's about 10 to 20 minutes. That does depend, though, on where the epicenter is for that earthquake. If it's further offshore, then that time is later. If it's closer to the shore, then that time becomes even shorter. So that brings me to our first team of my project, who's studying earthquakes, tsunamis, and landslides. And so they're asking questions like, how much time is available for evacuation? How well does a building or a bridge hold up after an earthquake to the tsunami? And then where does the debris end up that a tsunami is going to transport? If we can model that and say, okay, all the debris is gonna be piled up over here, can we be better prepared to clean, clean it up afterwards? And so we have some of, here's an example of some of the modeling that some of our hub members are doing. So on the left here, we have earthquake shaking, what that might look like. We have tsunami waves, how that might look propagating along the coasts, and then also building responses to and how buildings might be moving. So one of the issues with a major earthquake and tsunami is that certain locations will effectively become an island because roads and bridges will be damaged. So people and supplies are going to struggle getting in or out of an area. And so another one of our PhD students, Dylan Sanderson, is asking those questions. How will a magnitude nine event affect our local and regional connectivity? Would be like, how can I get to a healthcare facility in my community? 
versus regional connectivity is how could I get to my family's house that is across the river in the next town over? And so looking for Astoria, here are the model results for Astoria. Um, and so paying attention to this graph here, that is showing that regional connectivity, so again, how accessible places are outside of your community. And his metric for that was how connected to airports you would be. Zero is bad, so completely disconnected, and one is good, pre-earthquake travel times. The plot on the far right shows how long it takes for the RCI to hit 0.75. So that can be thought of how long it would take for a community to basically become unislanded. So for Astoria, you're doing pretty good. After the earthquake, it's predicted that your accessibility would very quickly rebound, though it would take some time to be completely back to normal for getting to places outside of here. But places like Newport, that's uh, about a year and a half that they're predicting for places like that. So as you can see, thinking about disaster preparedness goes well beyond the short term. It's thinking very long term, and it's also really starting to bring in some more social science, too. So that brings me to our last research team, who's looking at the adaptive capacity of communities with their overall goal to increase that capacity and figuring out how to do that. So they're helping to take research from teams one and two that I just talked to you about and making that actual, actually usable for communities. So they have a couple of goals, um, integrating different worldviews into disaster risk assessment, making tools for people, to evaluate their adaption strategies and help them pick the best one for, the, for their communities, building capacity of local governments to create more equitable adaptation strategies, and finally, uh, determining approaches that will best strengthen communities who will likely be isolated after a disaster event. So the last uh, project I'm going to talk to you about, I mean, actually Molly told my partner to read something for me. So he agreed to help me with this bit. So Ben, can you please read what I asked you to? <laughs> Hola a todos. La preparación para des desastres se puede hacer con tiempo. La recomendación tradicional de tener virtuales suficientes para tres días es un buen comienzo y sirve para los cortes de energía de poca duración o para evacuaciones temporales. Pero un gran terremoto y un tsunami dejarían gran parte de las rutas de transporte de la región destruidas y, por lo menos al principio, la llegada de ayuda y la distribución de suministros sería difícil o imposible. So, raise your hand if you understood everything he said perfectly. Raise your hand if you had some idea of what he was saying. Or raise your hand if you didn't understand the thing. I knew it was <laughs> Now, some of you might have had an understanding of what Ben said because of your cultural background or lived experience, but a lot of our disaster prep material is only in English. And so language is a major barrier for first-generation immigrants navigating our local systems. So what can we do about that? There's been about a 36% increase of Hispanics in Clatsop County for over the past couple of years. They're generally employed in low-wage place-based industries. Workplaces are generally located in high tsunami risk areas due to tourism. And so this project is trying to recognize Hispanic residents' cultural values and lived experiences and assess how that affects their engagement with existing preparedness resources. And so we have a team that is working to produce new hazards material and finding better ways to get that information out to our neighbors that are of the Hispanic community. And then we're sharing those findings back with them and then with emergency management officials as well. And so one of our master's students, Josh Blockstein, uh, who's working heavily on this research, has looked at 70 existing earthquake and tsunami awareness, preparedness, and response resources from federal, state, and local agencies, and review both English and Spanish versions. And he used focus groups to review these resources, these resources layouts, the language complexities, and cultural relevance. So he just had a focus group in Seaside this past January, and here in Astoria this past February, 
and got about 26 people that came to these focus groups. We had 62 survey responses. And so these are just preliminary findings from those focus groups, but those people that are your neighbors and that are part of your coastal communities want more resources and trainings in Spanish. More information on alerts and evacuation routes, first aid, emergency kits, caches, and also just trainings at their workplace. That's a lot of times what we hear they're spending a lot of their time and where they look for to get those resources. And so that project's next step is actually creating new materials in Spanish. Also, videos are highly sought after as well instead of just paper pamphlets. Um, community workshops, and then we'll be sharing those results with those emergency management offices. So the very last thing that I wanted to share is that we have pathways for people to connect to our hub members if you need coastal hazard support. That could be with research, science communication, or technical assistance. Um, I can help you connect if that's something you're interested in. We have a very brief survey on our website that can show you, can have you tell us what you're interested in, your need. And I'll try to connect you with one of our experts that will try to support your need. So everything that I just went over is a very small sample of all the work that our hub is doing. And what's cool is that people are not conducting their research in a silo. Our researchers are trying to learn how their work can connect to others. So how can the coastal erosion folks or the tsunami debris modelers learn from our social scientists and vice versa? How can we work with and learn from coastal communities to ensure that they're the ones benefiting from this work? Now, doing all of this isn't easy, but solving complex issues never is. But the members of this hub are trying to make steps towards a more resilient future for the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. The sea level rise. How much is the Columbia River affect? Is there a rise in the river too? You know, should we be concerned about it? Yeah, so you will definitely with sea level rise see an increase, especially at the river mouth and going uh, further up into the river. I don't know exactly how far up a river it would be affected. Um, I would say maybe a mile or so. Um, it really depends on the dynamics of the river itself for how much rise you're going to get. It's not going to be as critical, but you still are going to get higher king tides, for example, or higher floodings that's going to start to happen. It's 
less critical than along the coast, but it's still going to become an issue in the future, especially as you're, clo you're closer to the mouth of the ocean. Oh, hi. Um, one of your slides talked about revetment, I think. Yeah, dynamic and, revetment. Yeah, and logs and things. Um, my understanding is that riprap used to be a common way to mitigate that, and that um, it's in fact illegal to do that now. Do we need to revisit that and perhaps? That's a great what are question. Your thoughts? Um, yeah, so the person that is doing this work is looking at different usages of dynamic revetment. So one is how people putting in very hard structures, so very um, planned out, right? The, another project she's looking at is a cranberry farmer started just putting out large cobbles and logs, or what you would call riprap, um, to see how the coast would change all of that material to see if it would get into a place that would actually stop erosion from happening. Um, so we just went up and visited him over the summer, um, and so we were learning from him and what he was doing to see that that was actually working. And so that is something that we are looking at as to why it's working and learning from that and taking that into consideration. Hi. My question is a follow-up, but I'll start with a comment as far as how the river is changing, like during that King Tide event, I spent a lot of time on our trestles here in Alderbrook, and it was crazy. The, the, it was a combination of when the river was kicked up and it was raining heavily, but the high water was really impressive over the trestles and that. So I think it does impact the river. What, how many miles up at that then, right? But my question is whether COPEZ does any research on, um, like, forested riparian zones and their impact on flooding hazards. I'm really curious about that. Is that something you look at? We don't for this project in particular. I believe that we have some researchers that are on this project that are looking at similar things part of as part of separate projects. But, that um, but that's separate from what COPES is specifically focused on. But if you want to learn more, I can also try to connect you with someone who's okay. maybe looking at that. Seems like, seems like trees are important. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I just want to say, uh, I guess, you know, looking back like 15 years ago, there's been a lot of discussion about the Cascadia uh, earthquake and what it could do here. And there's been a lot of, like, very scared people for a long time about what the effects of this will be. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I assume you know Pat Corcoran, and I assume you know um, kind of his message these days. It's been like, uh, uh, let's not light our hair on fire and run for the hills. Let's, um, let's be reasonable about this and think about, you know, what the likelihood, statistically, what the likelihood of these things are to happen. And I think that's important um, um, as we realistically uh, consider the impacts or uh, the likelihood of this to occur right. uh, when, when, you, when we're presenting this kind of information because people get scared real quick. And I think, uh, I, I don't want to give a false sense of security, but uh, let's look at the data and let's make decisions based on the data. Yeah, and I, I think based on that comment, you're, you're definitely you're definitely correct, right? And I, you know, how I think about it is when you go to the coast or go to the beach, what are the ways that you could be prepared? So if you go to the coast, know where the evacuation route is, right? And so it's starting to make those steps to be prepared when it does happen, because we know that it will, right? We don't know exactly when. I said it's about 15% chance in 50 years. That is still a small percent. But if it does, you want to be prepared. So what are the ways that you can do that? And again, it's, it is that small chance, and so you definitely don't want to be scared to go to the coast. I love going to the beach. Absolutely love it. I'm an oceanographer. I'm going to spend time at the beach. We have our researchers spending weeks there doing research, right? And so it's more so making sure that at least you know the steps that you would take in case something like that would happen. It's being prepared in your homes. 
but knowing that you know maybe you could live your whole life and you never see it, but if it does, you probably want to still be prepared for it. Uh, maybe uh, you could address the river rat issue a little more. I I worked in uh, for soil and water conservation for about ten years. Did a lot of work with river bank erosion, and the problem with river rat, as you probably know and you can explain better than me, is that it doesn't absorb the energy of the river. It just bounces it somewhere else, and that's the big problem that I saw with rocks. Is you may put rocks on your property to protect your bank, river bank, but you're just taking all that energy and bouncing it across the river to the guy across from you, and he's got a problem. So we worked a lot with wood, big pieces of wood that would absorb more and more absorbs of the energy from that was causing the erosion. And maybe you could address that for what's happening on the coast. Yeah, so I don't think that I'm the best person to answer this because I don't personally do that work. Um, but from my understanding is if you have more of a, uh, if you have a very hard, like seawall, for example, if you have something that doesn't allow any of that energy to go through, then yeah, that makes sense that you would see something bounce right back. If you start to get things more like dynamic revetments or salt marshes, that water is able to go through it, and it, the, that wave energy is able to dissipate more versus it doesn't have something hard to bounce back on. Um, and so that is why one of our researchers is looking really heavily into dynamic revetments because it allows that energy to pass through and to dissipate as a, one of the best solutions to help for erosion. So I think that's the best answer that I can give, at least right now, for that. Yeah. Yeah, Jessa, please. So Oregon Shores, uh, who's the umbrella organization that I work for, actually is doing a lot of work and, and having conversations and doing research about um, riprap on the Oregon coast. And so they're a great resource to go to um, to, to, to learn more about, about the history, about the future, about what's happening now. One last question? Uh, well, maybe. He can ask, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a beautiful reading. We got a little bit of that. But we've got one question here. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate your presentations. Um, I will, in fact, be presenting here next week. Um, I'm with Oregon State University Extension. I'm regional fire specialist for the coast. So I'll be presenting on wildfire here in Clotsop County. And I wanted to ask you, Allie, you had mentioned uh, wildfire as a coastal hazard. So I'm just kind of curious what potentially you see for collaboration between your project and um, specifically with the OSU fire program. We're based on eco regions of the state. So I'm regional fire specialist for the coast. And I'd love to continue those conversations with you and Felicia and others. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, and one that we've gotten a lot on this project. Of, and so I came on after the grant was already funded, and so what I understand from those initial conversations is that um, they wanted to start with most of those coastal-focused hazards, and so they did have long conversations of if they should include fire. It was ultimately determined not at this time, but we're still having conversations now in terms of how can we maybe start to incorporate that more and all the issues that fire hazards can also lead into coastal hazards too. So definitely a continuing conversation that I'd like to keep having with you. I see you in the middle. Hi, uh, Benjamin Dalton from Portland. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to come out here. Uh, in all seriousness, I, one thing that you know, I have the opportunity to live with you, which is very awesome, I've never seen a lot of that data modeling that you showed. There was some really interesting stuff that, for some of us data nerds out there, um, I imagine that most of this is then compiled and then used to, you know, for, for uh, activism and political activism and, and getting information into the hands that are actually making decisions about how to manage the coast, how is the best way for the public to access some of the individual studies and the more specific pieces of work that are a part of your organization? 
Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so we're about two years into the project. So the first year is a lot of ramping up in terms of hiring our graduate students and hiring our postdocs, who are the ones who are doing a lot of the modeling work. And so a lot of the work that I just showed um, here are things that have just very recently been done, like within the past month they've been finished. Um, and so there's a couple of ways that we're making sure that things are being publicly available. One for all of our code and all those model results that's all going to be on an open repository. So everything's going to be online. So if someone wants to go and be like, how did you model that thing? You'll be able to go and find that, download the code, and be able to use that. We're also, I just got an intern who's starting soon, yay, and she's going to be helping me with our website and starting to build that out more and get more of the, the results from our research out on there so people can go find it there. We're also hoping by going to events like this, people start spreading the word. And then Allie and Jesse, I'm sure, will be happy to answer any questions afterwards. But I just want to thank Allie and Jesse for coming out, everyone.